audit risk model. This is the essential planning tool that the auditors use. It is set up in AU 312 and it is laid out as audit risk equals control risk times inherent risk times detection risk. However, we're never going to use it in this form. Instead, we're going to use it to solve for detection risk. And by applying algebra, we can say that detection risk is equal to the audit risk divided by the control risk times the inherent risk. So let's take a look at the components of the audit risk model. Audit risk is set by the CPA firm, and that is the risk the firm is willing to take on that client presenting them a set of financial statements that contain a material misstatement and then the auditors failing to find that material misstatement. The misstatement can be intentional, management fraud, or it can be an error. This is again set by the CPA firm. We can say we are willing to take a 5% chance that we will fail in our audit. So therefore we would set audit risk at 5%. The other way to look at this would be to say that we want a 95% confidence level that our audit will be successful. In the audit risk model, we're looking at the failure rate. Statistics uses more the confidence level. So here we're going to be looking at a failure rate. If we set the failure rate at 0.1, well, that's going to be a lower audit risk than if we set it at 0.5. So all of this is going to be determined by our trust in our client. Control risk is assessed by the auditor, but it's controlled by the client. So it's something that the auditor cannot control, but needs to measure. And control risk is the risk that a material misstatement will slip by the internal control system of the client. So we're looking for controls that either prevent or detect material misstatements. The auditor does not design the internal control system. The auditor is not part of the internal control system. Inherent risks relate to the assertions and their characteristics, and particularly their accounting characteristics. That is, the transactions that make up the assertions will be at a higher risk when they use a lot of estimates, when there is complex gap standards to be applied, or complex mathematical calculations in determining the account balance. So if we look at something like goodwill, goodwill is a very complex area of accounting. Remember, we need to establish goodwill. When we establish goodwill, we are basing it on fair value. Fair value is very judgmental and often difficult to calculate. So accounts that and, and assertions that rely on fair value have a higher inherent risk than accounts that are more based in historical cost. So again, this is assessed by the auditor and controlled somewhat by the client in the sense that it, it's going to be controlled by the environment that the client operates in. Sometimes the client can control it, sometimes they can't control the environment. All this leads up to detection risk. This is determined by solving for it in the using the audit risk model. It is controlled by the auditor. It is based on the judgments that the auditor uses to assess control and inherent risk and the amount of risk the auditor is willing to take. Detection risk has a direct relationship to the amount of evidence that will be gathered. If 
we set detection risk to be very low, well, we're going to have to have a lot of evidence to support our conclusion, and we'll have to evaluate that evidence correctly. Over on page 84 in Exhibit 3.4, they present this matrix that does a very good job of explaining the relationship between control risk and inherent risk and the detection risk that is established by the order vector. You will note, however, that order risk is not a component of this matrix at first blush. However, you see many instances where they talk about the risk being between moderate to high, low to moderate. Well, you're going to set that detection risk within these quadrants based on the audit risk that you have established. So if you establish a very low or low audit risk, well, then you're going to choose the appropriate detection risk here. So think about it. If we have a low control risk and a moderate inherent risk, and we set detection risk to be very, uh, excuse me, if we set audit risk to be very low, we want a very small chance of an audit failure, then we're not willing to take much of a risk, so we're going to choose more towards the moderate detection risk. Again, this is easier to see when you take a look at the extremes. We have low control risk, low inherent risk. Well, we're willing to take a lot of chances, so we're going to set detection risk as high and we won't gather the maximum amount of evidence. If on the other hand we have a high control risk and a high inherent risk we want to set detection risk very low so inversely uh, impact the amount of evidence so we're going to gather a lot of evidence and of course when we set detection risk lower that is going to increase our audit costs versus a situation where we can feel comfortable with our client and its environment and we can set a high detection risk. So in those instances where we have set a very low audit risk and we fall into one of these areas where there is a choice, which way we go will depend on the audit risk that we assign. And this is very well laid out in the textbook over on page 89. Uh, some people like to use a numerical representation of the risk as opposed to high, medium, and low. It's not a mathematical calculation. It's really an understanding of how the risks impact order planning.